fill out, so it's. Okay, look, we'll put it on the front row. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Don't you love the church? Yes. Don't you love when God's all up in the church? Yes. Like, how do people do church without God? I mean, you walk in, you're like, God's in here? Really? Where? And uh, God, he moves and, and, you know, he rides in on the, on the praises of his people. And you, you, you see those expressions of people in their, their worship. Emma, you came up and just, I don't know, you brought us to another level. She got wild this morning for Jesus. You're, you're a Jesus freak, huh? Remember that song, Jesus Freak? Yes. What will people think when they hear that I'm a Jesus Freak? Yeah. What y'all know about that? <laughs> Hallelujah. Some of you are getting freer and freer in your worship, yeah. and God loves that. I mean, he just, he just rides in on the praises of his people. Yeah. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm so excited about what God's doing. Somebody pinch me. I feel like I'm dreaming. I'm dreaming. This is revival. This is God waking up his bride and bringing her to what, what she really looks like. She is passionate. She's on fire for the one. She is pursuing him above all other interests. Why? Because he pursued us first. We love because he first loved us. He, he sort of set the standard, the bar of what love looks like. And he left heaven. He left his glorious throne. Could you imagine heaven? A little rainbow there. Angels all around, strange creatures. If you've ever read Revelations uh, 5, there's some strange creatures around the throne of God. There's lightning. There's thunderings. There's voices coming from the throne. It is glorious. And Jesus, he, he left that beautiful, glorious place, came down to earth because of you. I mean, he had you in his sights. And he just, he just wanted to inundate you with his love, with his love. He didn't come with religion and say, hey, look, I need you to measure up to this. He didn't come with that in hand. He came with his love. And that's what he poured out and bestowed upon each and every one of us. Hallelujah. How many of you are a recipient of the love of God? Yes. Come on. Aren't you glad he chose you before the foundations of the world? Aren't you glad he had you in his sights? I mean, you were, you were targeted. Hello, there we go. Nope. Paul said, I got to be stiff, uh, stiff preacher. Can you see me preaching like this? No. I got to move. If there's a little noise, y'all just bear with me. We'll try to iron out those issues. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. I don't know what happened to my son, but he ran up here and hugged his mama. <laughs> he wanted to rededicate his life. To the Lord. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I love what he's doing. I don't know what's going on in other places. I don't know if revival's still going on in other places. But I don't want God to pass through this place. And in a month from now, we'll be saying, hey, you remember, remember when God showed up in that service a month ago? I want God to find a place of habitation. And you know, not, not everybody's going to respond to the presence of God the same way. Some people will actually be repelled by it. And I pray for them. Don't, don't, don't settle for religion. Jump in. Jump in with what God is doing. This, this is a place of encounter. And so my heart is to, to lead, Danielle and I, our heart is to lead the church to passionately pursue Jesus as much as he pursued us. The same fire, the same intensity, the same tenacity, 
that we would run after him. And that this place, it would be a place where people encounter God. The true God, as Jesus said. The one and only. This is the place of encounter. Brittany came up to me and shared with me probably a week ago that the Sunday that we came back from the Outpour Conference, how many of you remember that service? It was like a kickoff. It was, I don't know, it, it ignited something in here. And at the end, I called the team that had went down to the Outpour Conference to come up to the front, and I had all those guys just lay hands on people. And, and uh, so Brittany, she came up to me, and she said, I think maybe it was a week later or so, she said, you know, uh, what happened last Sunday actually affected my whole week. She said, I've got joy. I've got peace. And she's all up in the workplace. She's counseling the counselors. And they're like, man, you, you come in here, you help me out. People in her family are looking at her. You know, she got that little faith talk now. I mean, you, you ever have that faith talk? You start talking <laughs> like your God is something. That's right. And people start looking at you, oh, okay. But, uh, but what happened in the service actually permeated her entire week. It affected everything. And she was marked by God in that service. And she walked away stained by what God had done. It, when you shared that with me, it, it reminded me of something that took place in the Old Testament. How many of you remember, remember the first king, uh, Saul, the first king of Israel? And Israel had desired a king. And God told Samuel that he had chosen Saul to be the next king, or to be the first king, really, of Israel, and God had arranged some things, and Saul was actually looking for his father's donkeys. He was the son of a man named Kish. Imagine Kish. What kind of name is Kish? Kish, the, the son of Kish. I want to kiss you, baby. <laughs> but he's out there, he's looking for these donkeys, and God had already arranged some things. He told Samuel, go and, and look for Saul. And I want you to anoint Saul to be the king of Israel. So when, Saul, when Samuel met Saul, he invited him to a meal. And he gave him the best seat in the house. And he gave him a double portion. Then he took a flask of oil and he poured it over Saul's head, anointing him to be the next king or the king of Israel. And then he gave Saul some instructions. I want to read this to you. This is out of 1 Samuel chapter 10. It says in verse 5, after that, remember he's giving Saul instructions of what was going to take place. You can imagine that, that Saul must have felt inadequate at that moment. I mean, he's tending his father's animals. And the next thing you know, hey, you're going to be the, the king. Talk about a tall order. And so he's given him some instructions as to what would happen next. And he says, after that, you shall come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is. And it will happen when you have come there to the city that you will meet a group of prophets. Now, in the Old Testament, they had these schools of prophets. They would gather together. These were students, and many times they had a teacher like Elijah or Elisha or Isaiah, some of these prophets that we read about in the Old Testament. And as students, they, they learn how to be a vessel and to yield to the Spirit of God. And when the Spirit of God would come upon them, they would begin to speak the words that the, the Spirit of God had given them. They would, they would prophesy. And so Saul is saying that you're going to leave my presence 
and you're actually going to encounter a school or a group of prophets. It was a gathering of the prophets, if you will. And it says, coming down, they'll be coming down from the high place with a string instrument, a tambourine, a flute, and a harp before them, and they will be prophesying. Now look at this, verse 6. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and be turned into another man. The Spirit of the Lord is going to come upon you when you enter the environment of these prophets and all of a sudden you're going to do something you couldn't do before. You're going to begin to prophesy and you're going to be turned into another man. And let it be when these signs come to you that you do as the occasion demands for God is with you. Verse 9 reads, So it was... When he had turned his back to go from Samuel, that God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. When they came there to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him. Then the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it happened when all who knew him formally, everyone who knew him In his past, when they saw him, that indeed he prophesied among the prophets, that the people said to one another, what is this that has come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Then a man from there answered and said, but who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb is Saul also among the prophets? Now, you and I, on a daily basis, we, we say these phrases, these, these proverbs, these idioms, if you will, in our everyday conversation, whether we're aware of them or not. How many of you have said, don't count your chickens before they hatch? I'll sing that to my kids. Don't count your chickens before they hatch. Or your eggs, sorry, chickens. Hello, help me. Don't count your eggs before they hatch. That's right. Chickens cannot hatch. Note to self. Yeah, we must be country, huh? There we go. How about when in Rome? Do as the Romans do. How about this one? Actions speak louder than words. Words. These are phrases that we use. They contain nuggets of of wisdom from the collective wisdom of of generation. But but this proverb that they said is Paul also among the prophets. This was used to express shock and awe. When somebody did something that was unexpected or out of character, it, it would be very fitting when... Danielle, she had her, her videos on, on Facebook. It was probably in regards to healing and what, what Jesus had done for her. And, and she had her, her videos on Facebook. And an old schoolmate had wrote on there, this must be an act of God for Danielle to be preaching the gospel and then putting it in video form and putting it on Facebook. It'd be very fitting to say, is Saul also among the prophets? I mean, Danielle is preaching the gospel. Or how about when Donald Trump, when he ran for office, he ran to the church and he said, would you pray for me? And leaders from all kinds of different denominations gathered around him and you see the pictures on the internet, they're laying hands on, I'm talking about Rodney Howard Brown, Shaka Rabaka, I mean, what charismatic minister, laying hands on him, prophesying. I mean, is, is Saul also among the, is, is Donald Trump a Christian? I mean, they, 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 leaders in the body of Christ said they, they had never seen the White House more open to daily Bible studies there and prayer. Leaders from all across America were going to the White House. I mean, is Saul also among the prophets? Is Donald Trump a Christian? I can't answer that. Only God knows his heart. 
But all that to say, it'd be very fitting to use that phrase. And so when Saul encounters this group of prophets, he, he comes into the environment that they had created. It was a culture, if you will, where the Spirit of God would move upon them and they would prophesy. And he steps into the arena where they had built a culture of the presence of God and he begins to prophesy. He is turned into another man. My hope and my desire is that when people step into this place, they will step into a culture of the presence of God and you will walk away and people will say something like, is Saul also among the prophets? Hallelujah. I mean, is Mr. Kenneth a preacher of the gospel? Hallelujah. Is Mallory a discipler? Is Chad a tongue talker? I mean, is Saul also among the prophets? Is Paul leading people to Jesus on a weekly basis now? Is he a preacher? Yes, he is. We're all preachers of the gospel. And so our heart is to see people that when they step into this place, that they actually experience the atmosphere of heaven itself, and they would marinate and stew in that very presence of God and be marked by God, and they would walk away a different person. Brittany walked away from that Sunday a different person as God turned Saul into another man, into another person. God wants to turn you and I into another person. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. I look at Jesus, and I want to be like him. I want to be like him. Are you with me? Yeah. Praise God. Woo! How many of you are ready for change? Because this, this is what takes. When, when revival shows up, when God shows up, when the normal kingdom activity shows up, God begins to transform people. I believe that some of you, you're going to look back in six months from now at yourself and you're going to say, who's that? I look back at my picture in the Navy. I'm like, who is that? Dead and gone, that's right. But God's about to transform. Some <laughs> Hallelujah. God's about to transform some people in this place. You know, when we encounter God, whether, whether it, it seems outrageous, like when Paul went to the outpour conference and hands were laid on him, he fell to the floor and he shook all night long. Or Monica, who received the joy of the Lord, God touched her and she began to laugh and laugh. Or maybe some of you, you've been kneeling down before the Lord and you heard a still, small voice. All of those encounters with God are significant and they are defining moments yes. in our lives. They can forever shape our future, our destiny, how we think, how we operate in life. These moments, they are defining moments. I think about Lazarus when he had died. How many of you are familiar with that story? When Lazarus had died, Jesus, the Bible says, he waited four days. He didn't respond immediately. He was in tune with the Father. I'm sure his initial reaction was to, let me, let me go get Lazarus. But the Father held him back. He was in tune. He was one with the Father. And so when four days were up, he heads out. And he goes to where Lazarus is. And when he gets there, accusations are hurled at him by Martha. If you would have been here, Jesus, my brother would have lived. If you would have been here, Jesus. Let's, let's turn there. Turn there to John chapter 10.
John chapter 11, actually. Verse 21, it reads, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, he's going to do it for you. Jesus said, your brother will rise again. And she said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But Jesus said, honey, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? What did she say? She said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. The word got out. Mary found out. Mary found out that Jesus was there. She came up to him, and she hurled the same accusation. Jesus, if you would have been here, my brother Lazarus would have lived. She came weeping. The group of people that came with her, they were weeping. And Jesus began to weep. And Jesus said, take me to the tomb. Take me to the cave. Jesus went and stood before that cave. And he said, roll away the stone. Martha said, but Jesus, there's a stench by now. There's a smell. There are some of you in this place today that you have experienced, like Martha, like Mary, a death, so to speak, in your, in your own life. Maybe it's in the area of finances. At one time, it was all that. But now, there's a struggle there. Maybe it's in the area of, of health. At one time, you were fit. You had great health. But now, there's this struggle. Maybe it's in an area of relationship with a spouse a child, a relative, a boss, a coworker, and now you're experiencing a death, so to speak, in your life. Maybe at one time you had the joy of the Lord, and now you're suffering with depression. I'm telling you that Jesus is standing before you today, and he's saying, roll away the stone. God's going to resurrect some things in your life today. And he's, just as he spoke to Lazarus and said, come forth, he's saying that to your finances. He's saying that to your relationship. He's saying that to your health. Health, come forth. Finances, come forth. Because Jesus is, not was, he is the resurrection and he is the life. The Bible says that Lazarus, he came out of that tomb and he was alive. This encounter with God, so to speak, it forever changed Martha, Lazarus, and Mary. How do I know this? Because six days before Jesus was to be betrayed, he was in the house of Martha, Lazarus, and Mary. And Mary grabs this very, very, very costly oil. The Bible says that she took this oil and she walked up to Jesus and she poured this oil of spikenard upon his feet. She came to anoint Jesus with something that was very, very, very costly, something that was very valuable. She didn't mind taking it and spending it on Jesus. She was willing to give him everything and that's what happens whenever you encounter God. You're transformed. You'll do whatever he says. When he told us to go overseas, we didn't think about the cost. All we knew was that we had been touched by love and we were going to go out of love for him. When God touches you, you're never the same again. When you allow his, his love to fill up your heart, you see differently, you hear differently, you feel differently, you think differently, you speak differently, you act differently. 
These are defining moments. This was a defining moment in Mary's life. And all throughout the Bible, we find people that encountered God in these defining moments. And they would actually give God a name that spoke of the characteristic with which they encountered God with. Sometimes they would even brand the location with a new name. Hello. How you doing? On one such occasion, a lady named Hagar, who was the maidservant of Sarah and Abraham, well, she got tired of what was going on between her and Sarah, and she hightailed it out of there. She was going to Egypt, and she was halfway there when all of a sudden the Lord appeared to her and said, hey, I want you to go back. I've called you, I've called your son, he's going to be mighty. The Bible says that she named the Lord. She gave God this name, Elroy, the God who sees, the God who sees me. I remember back in 1995, my mom had just kicked me out of the house. I went on a Greyhound bus all the way up to Pennsylvania, from Lafayette, Louisiana, all the way up to Pennsylvania by myself, 15 years old. I had my weed in my pocket. I had my Jimi Hendrix CDs. And uh, I move in with my dad, and he's a pastor at at an Assembly of God church, an associate pastor, and I started coming to the meetings. And my dad asked me if if I wanted to pierce my ears, and I was like, you're a pastor. You're going to ask me that? Sure. <laughs> so I had my ears pierced, my, my ear pierced, two, two piercings. And in the meeting, I was sitting about where you're sitting, Miss Robbins, and there was about 300 people there in the meeting Sunday morning. The pastor calls me up, and I come, and I stand in the middle, and he begins to prophesy. And he said, just as you have pierced your ear twice, I'm going to pierce your heart twice. And I remember tears came streaming down my face. And in that moment, I had a revelation that God is the one who sees me. It was a defining moment in my life. I remember coming back down for Christmas to see my mom. And I went back to my old neighborhood. I led all of my old neighborhood friends to Jesus. They were shakara bakara. I mean, they had never been in church. <laughs> and within a week, I've got them saved, filled with the Holy Spirit. We're having Bible studies on a daily basis. Hallelujah. It, it was a defining moment for me. Yeah. And all throughout the Bible, we, we find that people, they, they would name God Elroy. Sometimes they would even name the place. Uh, accord, they would give it a name. And they would add God up in the mix. She actually, she named that place. Hagar, she named that place. She, she called it Beer, Beer Lahoy Roy. And it means the well of the God who sees me. Last week we talked about Jacob. Jacob, in Genesis 28, he's running from his brother Esau. Esau wanted to kill him. He had cheated his brother out of his birthright. And then he deceived his father out of giving him the firstborn blessing. So Esau was wanting to kill Jacob. Jacob was on the run for his life. And he comes to this certain place. We talked about this last week. He comes to this certain place. And he has this encounter with God. He he actually dreams And in the dream, God comes to him and says, the promises that I gave to Abraham, that I gave to Isaac, I'm I'm giving to you as well. And he wakes up from this dream and he says, surely God is in this place and I didn't even know it. And he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than Bethel. Bethel means house of of God. I guarantee that Jacob walked away that day 
He was marked by that defining moment where he encountered God at Bethel, a place that he named. He carried that testimony with him. It was the place where he came into covenant with God, and he said, God, if you will bless me, if you'll bring me back here one day to see my fathers, then I'm coming into covenant with you now. I'm going to give you a tenth of everything that you put within my hand. Well, 14 years later, Jacob is running again. This time he's running from his uncle Laban, who he, you know, he cheated. You know, Jacob's name actually means supplanter, one who deceives, a cheater. His uncle catches up with him because he took off with his uncle's daughters and all the grandkids, and they just hightailed it out of there. And uh, his uncle Laban meets up with him, and they make amends, they make a covenant, they won't kill each other. And as Jacob is heading out, all of a sudden, he hears wind that Esau, his brother, is coming out to meet him with an entourage of several hundred guys. And he is scared. <laughs> he goes to praying, God of my father Abraham. God of my father Isaac, I'm calling upon you. You said that you would bring me back to this place. You said that you, 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 you said this, you said that. My brother's coming now and I'm, I'm scared. You said that you would multiply my children as the sand on the sea. He cries out to God. And the Lord comes the bible says that a man came and he was all by himself he had sent his families out the bible says that a man came to wrestle him well, when you look at it man it's capitalized that means god came to wrestle him think about that god came to wrestle with jacob and there's this, this wrestling going on. How many of you have wrestled with God? You see, God wanted to bring Jacob into the blessing. But there were some things in Jacob that had to die. And that's what the struggle was all about. There was a struggle. And finally, the Lord actually took his hip out of joint, out of socket. And the Bible says that he was still wrestling, Jacob, he was still wrestling with this man. He was wrestling with God with his joint out of, out of sorts. <laughs> and the Lord says to him, let me go. And Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. This is a revival scripture. I see this as Jacob saying, God, I'm not letting you go until you bless me, until you give me more, until you give me revival. I want you with me, and I'm not settling for anything less. God, bless me. Do you know what revival is? It's all about getting in the face of God. Notice. Revival is about getting in God's face. You know, when you get into someone's face, you're getting all up in their space. I mean, it becomes personal. But you see their essence. You, you see their intentions. And this is what Jacob was doing. He was all up in God's space. He was all up in his face. And God stops and he says, what's your name? And he had, he had to admit, I am supplanter. I am deceiver. Everywhere he went, he would deceive people. And the Lord says, from here on out, you will not be called Jacob. You will not be called deceiver. From here on out, you will be called Israel. Israel means prince with God. 
Someone who has strived with God, struggled with God, and yet prevailed. In other words, it's time for this part of you to die. You will no longer be known as Jacob. You're going to be known as prince with God. The Bible says that Jacob, now Israel, he called that place Peniel. And it means I've seen God face to face and I'm still alive. Can you believe it? That's what he called that place. He had a Bethel moment, Bethel moment, where he encountered heaven. He encountered God, and then he, he, he met God face to face. Hello. Today's the day. That was a good little tune there. Do you want me to talk to him? <laughs> want me to take that? Are they saved? <laughs> Tell them we're right in the middle of an altar call, powerful altar call. They're free to. <laughs> Hallelujah. There may be some of you today that you're, you're wrestling. You've been wrestling with God. There's this area of your life, maybe you, you've been holding back from the Lord, and the Lord's saying, hey, in order for me to bring you into the blessing, into revival, into more, I need you to let this go. Maybe, maybe your struggle has been, hey, I've, I've always been shy. I've always been a quiet person. I'm a quiet person. I really am. At home, I'm, I'm, I can be very, very quiet. And so when I get out in public, like the Lord's like, hey, talk to these people. Talk to these people. And I'm like, I just want to be left alone. I just want to be quiet. But there's that part of me that has to die because th th these are people's lives at stake. So may maybe there's an area... Of your life. Maybe it's an attitude of the heart. Maybe you've been holding on to unforgiveness towards someone, and the Lord's saying, Look, I, I want to bring you into a greater fullness of me, but you, you've got to let go of this unforgiveness. I think oftentimes we want God to bless our mess. When God's saying, Look, it's time to let go of what you were holding on to, and it's time to embrace what I want to give to you today. Maybe some of you, you, you've held yourself hostage because of your past. And you, you, you're having a hard time letting go of the past. But God's saying, today, Jacob dies. I'm giving you a new name. I'm giving you a new name. Today's a new day. Today's a new day. Anita, it was so good to see you dancing just in the freedom and joy of a Lord. That's beautiful. I told my wife years ago that it is beautiful when a woman worships God. When she's not, she doesn't care about what other people think. She's just free before the Lord. There's nothing more beautiful than that. Husbands, encourage your wives to worship the Lord. Love your wife. Tell her, you look so beautiful when you worship the Lord. It's freedom. It's freedom. Today's a new day. It's a new day. It's time to let go of religion. It's time to let go of religion and embrace the real, the authentic, that which God wants to give you today. Embrace a love for Jesus. Hallelujah. Why don't you lift your hands today? Heavenly Father, we're tired of wrestling. We're tired of wrestling. And Lord, we want to come to you today. We just want to let go. We want to let go of the things that we've been holding on. And we want to embrace all that you have for us 
today. Lord, in light of your presence, in light of your glory, those things that we hold on to are so, so trivial. So trivial. Father, let us see the, 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 the grand size of your presence and glory and blessing that you want to give to us today. I pray that even now, Lord, as there is a letting go, I hear the song, let it go, let it go. As you let it go, God's going to brand you with his presence. You're going to be a fire brand. And everywhere you go, you're going to catch others on fire. Father, I declare over this house and over these people that every day is Pentecost. Acts chapter 2 was Pentecost. Acts chapter 4, when they gathered together and the place where they were at was shaken, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, that was Pentecost. Acts chapter 8, when Philip went down to Samaria, that was Pentecost. Acts chapter 10, when Peter stepped into the house of Cornelius, and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. That was Pentecost. Acts chapter 19, when Paul met some disciples and laid hands on them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. That was Pentecost. Every day is Pentecost for the believer. Every day is revival, which is where God revives our very spirit. We become alive. We become full of the life of God, the hope of God of God, the peace of God, the essence of God. So, Lord, I declare over this people, Lord, that they would begin to encounter the face-to-face -face with you. Face-to-face -face with God. Lord, I know that just one glimpse, seeing your eyes, seeing your face, we will be undone. Lord, even as Isaiah was undone in your presence, you know, when the, Isaiah was in the room, he said he saw the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his robe filling the temple. And an angel grabbed a coal and touched his lips. And he said, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips in the midst of a people of unclean lips. That fire, that coal, that fire, it touched him. The fire of God touched him. And when God said, when he asked, whom shall we send? To go to the people. Isaiah said, Here am I. Send me. Lord, here we are. Send us. I pray that what you do in the hearts and lives of these people, Lord, it'll be so big. It'll be so big that they will say, Is Saul also? Among the prophets. Is Hannah also filled with the Spirit of God on fire preaching the gospel? Yes and amen. Is Miss Lisa also a faith healer? Yes, she is. She's a normal Christian that raises the dead, that preaches the gospel, that opens up the eyes of the blind. I thank you, Lord, that you're raising up normal Christians, Bible Christians, that we look just like the early church, that you're coming back for the kind of church that looks like the kind of church that you left 2,000 years ago. 
Hallelujah. Lord, I pray that what you're doing in this service, even right now, it permeates their entire week. That they walk away from this place reeling from what God did, from what God said, and that it becomes a defining moment that they carry with them everywhere they go. I bless these people, your people, God. And even as you declare to your church, Lord Jesus, you said, go and make disciples of all nations. I reiterate that command to your church. Go and make disciples of all nations. In Jesus' name.